This is Dave Thorpe's 1986 World Championship winning Honda RC500. Or at least we think it is. In this video, we will reunite Dave Thorpe with this machine and the man himself will either confirm or deny that this is the bike that propelled him to World Championship glory 37 years ago. And to make things even better, Dave's dad, Keith, who was his factory mechanic back in his racing days, will also be on hand to verify the legitimacy of this machine. And if it is truly the real deal, we'll know that we have something very special on our hands. And I'll make sure to go in depth to tell you guys all about it. Hi right, boys. Good trip down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. in the end. Sunny Devon. Wow. See, my riders moan about their footrest. Look at them. <laughs> nice hey. Tiny. What's the matter with them? But it does seem to be, from what I can see. No, that's a real one. Yeah. yeah it is. Would it, it's four, would it have been four speed in 86? It should be. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I was the only one on four yeah. speed. To be honest, I thought, oh, I don't think it'd be one of mine, but it is. Yeah, yeah. it appears to be. I mean, I guess your dad will know more, but... Hey, he'd be, he'd be keen to see it. Take yeah. it in. So now that Dave has confirmed that this is truly the real thing, we thought it would be a really nice surprise for Keith to take a look around this bike on what was actually his 86th birthday. Dave hadn't told his dad that the bike was coming, so he managed to quietly sneak the 500 into the workshop whilst Keith wasn't looking. This is Dave Thorpe's 1986 RC500. When well, we snuck it into his workshop today, Dave's seen it outside, but his dad, Keith Thorpe, who was his mechanic back in the day, hasn't seen it yet. And it's also his birthday, so we're gonna get Keith in now, we're gonna show him the bike, see what he reckons. Yeah, it's in there. So what do you reckon then, Dad? Is that one of ours? You'll know better than me. I think it is. But I think it's an early one, Dad, because the, the rad cap is still prominent. Yeah, it's definitely one of ours. Only what you forget there, isn't it? Yeah, I don't remember, actually. I don't remember the, that sticker there, either. No, but I wouldn't look at that sort of thing. Did you put them on, Dad, look, for the carne? Is that you? They, so they got the, rather than have the chassis number, it's one that's, so that you could do the carnes. No, I, I wouldn't have put that on. You wouldn't? No, the Japanese might, but I wouldn't have done it. Ah, okay. But that would have been what that's for, wouldn't it? So they yeah, could change, because yeah, yeah. they got rotated, didn't they? Yeah. And my bars as well. Yeah. And my grips. Nice one, isn't it? Yeah, it is a nice one. Some people are going to be disappointed that they haven't got the only one. <laughs> well, there's at least two now, isn't there? Yeah. That's um, one of the best I've seen. Yeah, I don't it is. Think that's well, they, did, they didn't have them in the States, did they, Dave? No, they so, didn't. Not at that time. No. That, that was the last of the... The last of the factory factories. Factory yeah. This is what people all got excited about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, idiots like me. <laughs> what were they like to work on, Keith? Knew them inside out in the end. <laughs> but very reliable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's got a four speed box as well. Yeah. So that is ours. That is ours. Yeah. Because Andre rode and Eric rode five speed. Yeah, most of the time. When they got beat, <laughs> they might have changed to a four speed for a while. Watching the legendary Keith Thorpe take a look around one of his old steeds really was a special moment for everyone involved. Listening to him point out certain parts of the machine and tell stories from back in the day was a true privilege. He had a big old smile on his face and we really do hope that it was a nice birthday surprise for him.
now that we've had the royal seal of approval from both of the Thorps and we know that this machine is legitimate, it's time to take a close look at the bike to find out what made it so special back in 1986 and to hear some of the memories that Dave has of conquering the world that year. I'll be chatting with Dave to hear some of those stories. And my good friend Dave King, who is one of the world's foremost experts in this era of motocross, and the man who co-founded the awesome VMXDN Fox Hill event, he'll be giving us a tour around this incredible RC500. But before we get into that, I just want to tease something that we've got coming up on the channel very soon. Myself and Dave King are about to go on a hunt for some of the world's rarest and most interesting motocross bikes. We're going to be going around Europe looking for these machines, and when we go on trips like that, I don't go anywhere without my 24MX gear bag. Our channel is sponsored by 24MX, and we couldn't make videos like this one and the ones we've got planned coming up very soon without their support. So be sure to check them out and say thanks for supporting 999 Laser. You can get a personalised gear bag just like my one and you can get 15% off if you use our discount code 999LASER. It's currently Black Friday month as well so they've got awesome deals across the website on a whole load of products. As always, a big thank you to 24MX for supporting the channel. And guys, make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and tune in for the next couple of weeks because me and Dave have some very interesting videos on the way. After an incredible 1985 season, winning his first 500cc World Championship riding his HRC Honda, Dave Thorpe came into 1986 on top of the world but his first title defence would prove to be a difficult one. The bike had changed somewhat and the competition were looking for revenge. But riding this very machine, they thought was able to fight off all challengers and conquer the world for the second consecutive year. Let's hear what he remembers from that time. So we're here in the workshop. Dave, we've got one of your 1986 RC500s here in front of us. What are the emotions that this bring, bike brings up when it rolled in here today and you saw it for the first time? Yeah, for me, it, this was, this was always, the, for one for a better word, the sexiest bike to look at. Yeah. For me to ride, it wouldn't have been my favourite. It was less forgiving than my 85 bike. Um, in terms of the engine or the chassis? I think it's more chassis. Engine, this one was slightly different, but that was fine. I just, yeah, I just felt this bike was just a little bit more rigid mm -hmm. than the 85. But to look at, I loved it. Yeah. yeah. Me and Max, we did a video, you might remember it, probably four or five months ago, on, I think you titled it The World's Most Expensive Dirt Bike. Yes, we did, yeah. Well, this is a new video. And this is the world's most expensive dirt bike. I'm not going to tell you how much it was because it was a crazy amount of money, but this is the number one factory bike that any collector would dream of, the 1986 world title winning Dave Thorpe RC500. And I'll just run you around. A lot of the parts will be very common to the video we did before with the Andre Maller bike, but with um, a lot of subtle differences that I've learned a lot this morning from Dave. In his book, No Regrets, Dave talks about the transition between 1985 and 1986 and the difference between the two bikes that he rode in those years. After championship success with Mulherb in 1984 and Thorpe in 1985, HRC promoted the RC500 project leader. So there was a new man in charge with fresh ideas for the 1986 season. How different were the bikes year to year in the years that you was on Honda? When I first started, um in 82 I, I t it says in the book i tested graham's bike which was air cooled yeah then i signed then we went to america and then they produced the walk cooled bike which was the first evolution of the 85 bike really uh, sato sam was the project leader at that time and that bike yeah it developed really 83 was a difficult bike to ride again but 84 it started to come good we all started to understand it all and in 85 for me everything just accelerated. Andre won in 84, I won in 85 so uh, the Japanese personnel changed and then this was you know the next guy that would come along that had his thoughts in how it should be in motocross and yeah what could work a little bit better for Honda and the team and and this is you know what we, we saw. So what were the main differences between your first world championship and your second world championship then? Um, the chassis was slightly different 
the engine, I'd evolved as a rider, so during testing we kind of went in a slightly different direction. It was less of a linear curve with this bike. This bike was a little bit sharper. And of course this, you know, when Honda started to develop this seats mm -hmm. where you could sit right forward, they were the main differences. I don't know whether I'd have had a different season in 86 if I'd have ridden my 85 bike, you know, whether I'd have been more comfortable. I kind of don't feel I, I rode as good in 86 yeah. as I did in 85, so you'd never really know. But you know, the fact is that this bike you know, got me home and uh, we won the championship, yeah. so history tells us 30 plus years ago it was, it was the bike to have. Yeah. The engine, full factory RC500, importantly for Dave, four speed. Andre and Eric rode five gears, Dave rode four because he, he preferred it, I suppose with the torque of the engine. And very interesting, he just told us he used to start in third gear on this bike, which I've never heard of, you know, crikey. <laughs> Second gear I thought was probably the, the best you were ever gonna get, but a third gear start, no wonder he, you know, he was a good starter on this bike. So for 86, first time ever, you saw a disc brake on a 500 Honda. So on the 85, we had a drum brake on the Andre Mallard bike, but on the 86, we had, we had the disc brake. And I'm, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. I, I don't think there's anything on this bike that is production or that you could go out and buy yourself back in that era. This is a total one-off hand-built bike, everything. Every nut and bolt, every piece of plastic, there's nothing on here that a punter could have gone out and bought. You had to earn that ride. You had to be a factory rider to get this bike. As we've already touched upon, the 1986 season wasn't quite as straightforward for Dave as the 1985 campaign had been. It was a season of highs and lows. But nonetheless, being the champion that he is, Dave managed to get the job done once again. What were your favourite memories of racing this bike firstly, and then maybe the least favourite as well? Favourite was, I don't know if it was so much about the bike, but I was kind of proud to have the number one plate. Yep. That meant a lot to me. The pressure that come with it maybe that was why I rode the way I did in 86. The downside to this bike that I remember is uh, is the rad. If anyone reads the book you'll yeah. see in Austria um, unfortunately my knee caught that and flipped it off which lends me to believe that this is probably an earlier bike for the season because after this that this rad side changed they developed one which come up higher. Um, How quickly would those changes happen in HRC? Would it be like literally next GP you've got yeah. that sorted? Yeah they HRC when they want to do something as history tells us through motocross or GP road racing superbike when they want to change things uh, they can change them really quickly yeah. if the rules allow yeah. um, and at that time in motocross there wasn't too many rules holding them back in development, um, so they, they were pretty special. So you've got the factory shock here, and again, this is just having a chat with one of Dave's mechanics um, on the modern bikes, and he said, you know, is it um, kit suspension? Well, back then, there was no such thing as kit suspension. You couldn't go and buy a kit forks or um, or anything else. You had, you, bought, you had production forks and you had full factory stuff and that's what this is, so you, you had no option. So you've got the factory shock, aluminium subframe, all hand-built plastics, and the thing that everybody wanted back then was the Coke bottle swinging arm. This, uh, when did this started? 1981, I think Honda started this and went right through until 89, and every kid on a, on a Honda wanted one of these things, but again, they were totally unobtainable. Um, lovely little details like the aluminium brace to stop your, the heel of your boot or your, the inside of your boot hooking up against the, the brake lever. But look how tiny those foot pegs are. That was the first thing that Dave picked up on when he looked at the bike. You know, how on earth did they, they wrestle these bikes around? Probably 60 horsepower with a foot peg that's probably inch and a half by an inch in, in size. It's just crazy. As the 1986 season drew to a close, it was becoming a four-way fight for the 500cc World Championship. Dave was battling a trio of Belgians in Andre Malherbe, George Jobe and Eric Gabors. And things got a little naughty at the French GP. With George Jobe running away with the race lead, Thorpe and Gabors were left battling between themselves. On the very last lap of the day, the fight came to a head 
and Thorpe put Gabor's on the floor. There's a really interesting chapter on this moment in Dave's book. This is the quote. Dave says, I went down the inside of him thinking, he's going to shut off. But he's thinking, Dave isn't going to hit me because he's my teammate. But I hit him, hard, and he went down. It was desperation. I didn't feel good at all. I didn't look back, but I knew what I'd done. I wanted to know how Dave feels about that moment now, especially standing next to the bike that quite possibly took out the kid that day. Reading up on the book last night, just refreshing my memory, and maybe your lowest point you say in the book was France. Yeah, it's one of those things. I mean, I, uh, I am a competitive guy. Even at my old age now, I'm still competitive. And that competitive edge crossed the line, really, on that day. Eric and I remain good friends after that, so um, it was probably a little bit more tragic from my side than mm -hmm. it was his, because I felt really bad about it, because we were friends. Yeah. Fortunately for me, he took it like the great guy he was, and um, it didn't affect our friendship. During the 1980s, HRC enjoyed a dominance that is rarely seen in any sport. In both 1985 and 1986, the HRC factory riders owned all three steps of the 500cc World Championship podium. And Honda won the 500cc World Championship eight times during the 1980s and 12 times in the 14 years between 1979 and 1992. These bikes must have filled their riders with insane levels of confidence, especially over their non-HRC competition. Full magnesium engine casings, and again, one of the things that, that all of us would have, would have loved was the low boy tank. So there's a vacuum pump down here because obviously the, the bottom of the tank is lower than the carburetor that used to feed fuel back into the, into the carburetor. Moving forward, these huge handmade plastic rad scoops, just so different to the production bike. And the, the beautiful two-piece, can you get in there, Max, and see that? Just, it's just, just a work of art, those radiators. This thing should have been built by NASA. It, honestly, it's just like a spaceship. And if you look at this angle, Max, you can see where the, where the radiators are stepped back. It's just attention to detail everywhere. When you're lining up on this bike and you're looking across at all the other guys that aren't your teammates, what are the things about this bike that made you think, yeah, I've got an advantage here? What were the main aspects of racing an RC that gave you that confidence, that competitive edge? At that point, I'd never really ridden any other factory bikes. So whilst I always felt that the Honda was the bike to have and certainly the backup that we had with HRC, yeah, proved that. But I don't know, um, you know, George, he rode the Kawasaki really well. Kurt at that time rode the KTM mm -hmm. really well. Would they have ridden as well on a Honda? Probably better. But it's only history that tells you that, you yeah. know, when you look back through the history books and you look at how many GPs and Grand Prix wins and World Championships Honda had, it really does emphasise how, how much ahead of they were of the competition yeah. during the 80s, really. Magnesium lowers on the forks, obviously conventional forks, the upside down ones didn't come in until, crikey, 89 was it or 88, the first ones on the factory bikes? 80, 89 I think. Um, interesting little detail here, built in, I'm going to have to put my glasses on just to see this properly, but built into the lower clamp is this funny little like cup, but that was to locate the top of the um, fork gaiters, they popped under there and then they went over the top of the, the uh, fork leg just to stop them, th there was any chance of them coming out. We had Keith in this morning, so today is Keith's birthday, it was a surprise for him to see the bike. I asked Keith about the history of this fender brace, because you hear so many stories of these things, whose idea was it? And yes, it was Keith and Dave that came up with this idea together, because Dave didn't like when it was a muddy race, he didn't like the front of the mudguard wobbling around. He, he found that distracting. So Keith and D Dave developed the fender brace that stuck on these bikes for probably four or five years on the factory Hondas, and I still see bikes with these today. I know 
from coming to some of your vintage motocross days, you ride a 250 on those days, not a 500. But when you see this bike rolling here, does it give you a little feeling, oh, I'd quite like to start that up and take it for a little spin around the field, or not at all? Um, if Dave was to start it, then I'd be quite happy to have a little tot yeah. around. <laughs> But the prospect of kicking it, yeah. I mean, I used to hate kicking it when I was in my 20s. Yeah. So now I'm in my 60s, that little kickback is not something that I'd relish. Imagine how Eric felt though. Well, I know, <laughs> I know. And, you know, there's so many things, you know, like now we're all, you know, we've got the benefit of the button. We've got the benefit of many things on the modern day bike. But the one thing that would be difficult is the, is the kickstart, because yeah. it was always difficult to start. Handmade gear, HRC gear change. In fact, that part there is, has not changed a whole lot, even to the factory Hondas of today, to the bike of Tim Geiser, still looks extremely similar to that. I think that's like a forged steel piece. Um, again, all handmade. Magnesium casings, beautiful handmade uh, pipe. Even the sprockets all would not fit a, fact, uh, would not fit a standard bike or completely just to fit the um, the factory wheels, there were different spacings on the bolt pattern and on the on the the centre. So there was there was just nothing on this bike that was comparable to to a production bike, and that's what made them so special. So you're probably watching this video and thinking, how come there's so many of those factory Hondas still left? Well, there's actually not, but I'll give you a little history lessons on the ones that survived in Europe. So back in 2008, Dave Thorpe contacted me and said, Dave. I want to sell my three bikes. Honda had given him his 85, his 86 and his 89 uh, world title winning RC 500s. But in Honda's wisdom back in the day, they took out all the engine internals and all the suspension internals. So they were just show bikes, they couldn't be ridden. So I placed the 85, went to South Africa. The 86 at that time stayed in the UK and I bought the 89. And as many of you will know, I sourced all of the genuine factory parts that were missing from my 89 bike. And Dave rode it at the very first VMXDN in 2009. Still a special moment for me. So coming on to these bikes, a number of bikes were put into storage at the Honda facility in, I believe it was in Stuttgart in uh, southern Germany. And very fortunately for us, the fans, one guy that worked there decided to put five bikes away. Perhaps he saw what was coming, you know, perhaps he knew that these bikes were, he knew they were so special because he worked there, but he knew um, that many generations to come would like to see these bikes. He put an 84 Andre Malab RC500 away, an 85 RC500 away, which you've already seen the video that me and Max did uh, several months ago. He put this 86 RC500 away, and Eric Gabor's 88 RC500 and Dave's 89 RC500 away. Not my one. My one was never what I would consider complete. These five bikes stayed at Honda in Stuttgart for many years. And then around about, I want to say mid 90s, 95, 96, somebody at Motor Verte in, in France, the magazine got hold of them and did a test on them. That's, um, there's a magazine with those five bikes on the cover. I can't read French, so I can't tell you what the, what the outcome was, but I suspect all bikes were very, very good. Um, and then those bikes went to a car museum in Hockenheim where they probably sat a little bit uncomfortably, to be honest, for best part of 30 years. Bikes in a car museum, I don't think ever, ever sits well. They want to be in a bike museum. So anyway, these bikes stayed down there in Hockenheim until I would say about 10 years ago. And I believe that there was a redevelopment of the museum there. And these bikes were suddenly surplus to, to requirements down there. Somebody at that museum contacted Eric Gabors, the late great Eric Gabors, and said, Eric, there's some bikes here and we think one of them's yours. To cut a long story short, Eric collected those bikes and Eric then sold them to a collector uh, in Europe. And that's how those bikes survive today. To my knowledge, the, well, I can tell you where everyone is. The 84 Mallard bike is back in the UK. The 85 Mallard bike is back in the UK with a different collector. 
the 86 uh, Thought Bike is back in the UK. You can see a common theme coming here. Uh, the 88 is still in Europe and the 89 is back in UK. So four out of five bikes are back in the UK and I wouldn't mind betting the fifth one will be back here very soon. You know, there's always a backstory to these bikes and I, I love those sort of things. You know, it fascinates me. Just to recap on Dave's original three bikes, where they are, I believe the 85 is still in South Africa. The 86 got resold and is now in the USA. So that's not the 86 that we're talking about today and filming about today. That's that was Dave's bike that was a part that was had to be built up out of spare parts. And the 89 that I had is in the USA as well. This is the first time I've seen and touched a complete 86 RC500. So it is the world's most expensive dirt bike. Well, Dave, I hope you've enjoyed seeing this bike again. It's been an absolute pleasure for us to all make this happen and to show it to the guys at home. What an honor this has been. No, no, this uh, is definitely um, one of the best bikes in the history of motocross. And that goes from back in the eighties right the way through to today. It's a very special bike and um, I'm pleased it's in England. I don't know if in 30 years time we'll be sat there with Tim Geiser bike with a whole room of people gawping over it. I don't know. I think you might. I think um, Tim's bike technically is a lot further down the ladder than we all perceive because in the eighties the production bike was completely different visibly. Yeah. I do feel that the factory bikes, the technology that they have in them, I think is special and it, it intrigues me. But, you know, whether the Tim will stand in my shoes and have this conversation yeah, yeah. with someone, who knows? Well, tune back in in 30 years and we'll have that video for you then. So if you want to know more about Dave's life and career and watch him riding this bike actually and hear about him riding this bike, definitely check out the book No Regrets and the DVD No Regrets. You can actually see him racing this thing on this DVD. You can get them both on his website at davethorpe.co.uk. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you really enjoyed this video. It was a special one for us to make. A big thank you goes to Dave Thorpe, Keith Thorpe, and all of the team down there in Devon, and also to Dave King for making this video possible. Be sure to check out his event, VMXDN Fox Hill. It's going to go off there during the August bank holiday weekend next year. We'll be there and we cannot wait. As always, guys, my name is Max. You've been watching 999 Laser. Until next time, I'll see you at the track.